Thanks for listening. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one coaching with Dr. Lodi, please visit drsudliff.com. I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sada Flody, and this episode is everything you need to know about menopause and hormone replacement therapy. Before I get into it, though, the first thing I want to make very clear is that I'm not giving any type of medical advice. So if you have any concerns about your health, please see your healthcare provider. And if you have any questions about your religion, please speak with your friendly neighborhood religious leader. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman that talks about sex. So before we get into the episode, just a, a few things I want to let our viewers know about uh, that I am hosting a retreat at the end of May. It'll be totally awesome. It's from May 19th through the 21st. Um, so go ahead, go on the link on my bio and make sure you click on it and register because space is very limited. Also, uh, if you like this episode, please share it, review it, and give us uh, five stars. We love the five stars. And um, if you are looking for one-on-one -on -one coaching, please feel free to reach out. And now let's get into the episode. So I, it's my pleasure to welcome again, Dr. Karen Men. She is a totally awesome OBGYN that is certified in menopause therapy and also is a breast cancer survivor. So if you didn't hear the previous episode, please go on and take a listen. She tells of her amazing story and gives so many resources and helpful tips on what to do and how to advocate if you or your family member has been diagnosed with um, cancer. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Men, if you could please introduce yourself again in case uh, somebody has not heard your previous mm -hmm. episode. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and thank you for what you're doing for women. You're doing amazing work. So again, yeah, Dr. Corinne Men, um, I'm a board certified OBGYN and um, a North um, American Menopause Society certified menopause practitioner. So you'll hear me use the word NAMS. That's the North American Menopause Society um, a lot on this episode because they are the premier professional scientific organization, which um, advocates for women at midlife and, um, you know, produces guidelines and clinical practice materials um, for menopausal care. So uh, that's the, um, you know, I got certified by them and that's where, um, uh, you know, those are, I use their guidelines for um, you know, making all kinds of clinical decisions for my patients sure. because it's evidence and science based. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I practice exclusively telehealth. Um, you can find my practice drmen.com, and I do telehealth in. Um, I'm licensed in about 20 states, um, and then in states I'm not licensed in, I can do patient education consults and help them get the resources so that they can work with their own doctor. And then I'm also um, a menopause practitioner and prescriber on Alloy, which is a, a women's um, menopause telehealth platform, and I'm a medical advisor there. Um, so yeah, and so my practice is really, um, you know, I, I do all different women's health consultations, but the bulk of my practice is helping women through perimenopause and menopause, as well as women who are high risk for breast cancer or breast cancer survivors like myself and helping them deal with um, sure. menopause. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, it looks like there was a New York Times article that came out today uh, about why women have been misled. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the article was written by Sue Dominus of the New York Times. Um, I actually, she interviewed me for over an hour for this article, background material. I'm not quoted in the article, but I did get to speak to Sue. Um, and she also spe spoke to people um, at Alloy, where um, you know I'm an advisor at. And so we're, we're featured in that. So that was exciting. But, but, but Sue wrote this amazing article. It's on the cover of New York Times Magazine, basically, the title, Women Have Been Misled About Menopause. And it really dives into why so many women and doctors, OBGYNs, internists, anybody who cares for women, have been really provided with um, misinformation 
and kind of just this feeling that um, treating women who are symptomatic at midlife during the menopausal transition, uh, this idea that treating them for their, their symptoms with hormone therapy was dangerous, ill-advised, and should be limited to the lowest amount for the shortest amount of time, or just completely deny them of that and told, telling them to basically deal with it. So basically the, the, the article to me was super important. It was all information I've known for quite a while. And anybody who is really involved in menopause care has known these guidelines on what's safe and how we should be dealing with women is actually been, we know, we, we know the data, the data has been there. The problem is, well, about 20 years ago, there was a very large study that was abruptly halted and the media picked up this message and it got sent out, you know, to the masses throughout the world, basically. And really overnight, most women stopped their menopausal hormone therapy out of fears that they were going to have an increased risk of breast cancer, stroke, cardiovascular disease. And so that was very traumatic on patients and doctors. And it's taken over 20 years for everyone to realize that the study was misinterpreted. The messaging was very poor. Um, and there was a knee jerk reaction and, you know, women's health really suffered over 20 years because of that. Finally, we're seeing a big movement now. And this, this article to me was really important because I can sit and counsel a patient again and again about all the evidence-based guidelines and why it's safe in the far majority of women to treat them if they're symptomatic and there's lots of secondary benefits. But until a woman feels that the message culturally and in, in pop culture and, in, and um, in mainstream media, that there's a message that it's acceptable and safe to treat your, you know, your symptoms with you know, hormone therapy, they're very skeptical and they're a little distrustful as their doctors because women, people in general, um, you know, have, they're, they're, they're skeptical about medicine. And often I find they're willing to trust, you know, messages that they see in popular culture over what their own doctor is telling them. And, and then and the other problem is, is that, that the article brings up is that um, even when they, they, they do seek care, a lot of their doctors were victims to that misinformation and they, they were also very ill-informed and ill-equipped. And you know, we talk, we've talked about it before, how a lot of OBGYNs, our training doesn't train us on how to take care of women at midlife and menopause. So, Absolutely. you know, I think the lack of training and this like bad messaging from this study that's kind of been, it was outdated and we have a lot more data now. I think those two things are a big part of why women, you know, don't have the information. Um, but so being in the New York Times makes it, it elevates it. So lots right. of women are talking about it now. So I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I still remember where I was, you know, when we were given information about that WHI study and you know, all of us residents were sitting around with our mentor and he's telling us, you know, all the reasons why we can't prescribe it. And, you know, you and I have talked about this, how just like a whole generation of OBGYNs just never prescribed hormone replacement just because we didn't feel comfortable with it, you know? So I wanted to go over a little bit over, you know, what the indications might be for somebody that's seeking treatment, you know, when should they go? Uh, what is the best time to go for hormone replacement? And, you know, if there's any type of reasons why they shouldn't get it. Sure. So the first thing is, you know, first message, anybody who's perimenopausal, so understanding perimenopause is the decade leading up to menopause. Menopause is the end of your periods, right? One year with no menstrual period. Women are often highly symptomatic during perimenopause and certainly in menopause. And the symptoms um, that women should know um, are, there's many, it's not just hot flashes and night sweats, although those are the most common things that women will complain about. But there's many other symptoms, including anxiety, mood changes, um, sleep disturbances, anxiety, um, palpitations, um, heart palpitations, um, hair changes, skin changes. We're going to talk a lot about today, genital urinary changes, changes in your bladder, vagina, sexual health. Um, and there's many more symptoms. So, um, you know, I think a lot of women don't even realize they're like, what is going on with me? Like, am I going crazy? Like, why are these body changes happening? And they, they don't even realize sometimes that it is like their hormonal 
changes that are happening. And some women, you know, sail through that transition easier, some don't. So what the first thing is recognize your symptoms, understand that your perimenopausal or menopause, these are common symptoms. And, and basically when should you seek treatment or when should you talk to your doctor about it? If any of these symptoms are affecting the quality of your life, how you live your life day to day, or if you're concerned about the loss of estrogen and you're concerned about prevention of osteoporosis, those are two reasons to go and get, um, you know, assessed and see, you know, what treatment solutions are for you. Um, and then the third very important thing is if you've had premature menopause for any reason. So these women are often underlooked. So if you've had your ovaries removed um, under the age of 50, if you went through early menopause between, you know, under the age of 45 and certainly under the age of 40. So those are the primary indications um, that the FDA has approved for menopausal hormone therapy. So premature menopause, symptomatic menopause, prevention of osteoporosis, okay? And the prevention of genitourinary syndrome and menopause. So those are four indications that women should know, okay? So those are considered the primary indications and reasons for prescribing menopausal hormone therapy. And I want to make, I just want to, this is like a little nuance, but it's important for women to understand, yes, we use the words hormone, HRT or hormone replacement therapy interchangeably with menopausal hormone therapy, but we really are trying to move to this MHT, um, menopausal hormone therapy, because hormone replacement therapy signifies we're completely replacing the same level of hormones that you were when you were younger, when you were in your reproductive years, right? But that's not true. Menopausal hormone therapy is much lower dose. It's a touch, a little bit of menopausal therapy, just a little bit of hormones to ease symptoms, protect you from bone loss and the genital urinary um, syndrome changes. And there's lots of secondary benefits that we can, we're going to talk about for sure too. Um, so yeah, that term I think is, is, could be a little comforting to women because we're not replacing in large amounts. We're just giving you enough so that your quality of life is better. That's awesome. I'm glad you corrected that. I didn't even know that there was well, you know, a mean, difference in the terminology. Yeah. I mean, we, we use both, but it's like we are trying to trend towards that. Um, so I think, yeah. So first, you know, the symptoms. OK, I just told you the four indications of, of, of why um, you can, you know, FDA has approved the various menopausal hormone therapy options. And I'm going to just say for the purposes of discussion today, the low dose birth control pill for a perimenopausal woman is menopausal hormone therapy. All right. So it needs, it needs a brand, a rebranding. <laughs> um, yes, it's a birth control pill, but for many women who are perimenopausal, maybe their spouse had a vasectomy, maybe, you know, you know, they don't need birth control. Maybe they're not sexually active, but a low dose birth control pill should really be considered the perimenopausal pill because it does provide a little bit of hormones and helps with the very erratic and irregular um, hormone secretion that's happening in perimenopause that causes a lot of symptoms. So when I talk MHT, I'm also talking about the birth control pill for the younger women who are symptomatic. Um, yeah. So what, what would you say is like a, a reason why somebody, you know, may not be able to get hormone? Therapy. Yeah. So excellent question. So there's very few absolute contraindications where we say, absolutely, we're not going to give you hormones to help you with your symptoms, but we do have non-hormonal options for you. So when I, when I tell you about the absolute contraindications, I don't want women to feel like, oh my God, there's nothing for me. That's not true. There are non-hormonal options. And my job as a doctor is to show you, here's your hormonal options. Here's your non-hormonal options. Here's your lifestyle options let's weigh the risks and benefits of all of these options and decide what's best for you. So absolute contraindications are very few. Um, active breast cancer or a breast cancer history, although we're going to touch base on that at the end of this discussion because it's a little bit more nuanced. But in general, if you've had breast cancer, we're going to look for non-hormonal options for you. Um, um, active liver disease um, blood clot, a personal history of a blood clot or stroke. Although there are, uh, that's another caveat. If you, there are women who have had a, a blood clot in the leg due to a very specific provoked incident. They were in a car accident or there was something that specifically caused it. And otherwise they don't have 
you know, a big risk, those women may be able to take it. But for the vast majority, you know, of women, they don't have an absolute contraindication. And in fact, recent studies have showed, I think like upwards to 30 or 40% of women think that they have a contraindication so that they can't, you know, and that's part of this, we need to educate women. So here's this, these are interesting. These are things that are not contraindications. I think this is more interesting. So if you're between the ages of 50 and 60, we so we kind of talk about this timing. The ideal candidate to getting treatment is someone who is symptomatic and someone who is in within 10 years of their last menstrual period. Um, so wh whatever comes last, whether it's under the age of 60 or if say your last period was at 57, 10 years, you have up to like 67, 68 where you're still in that window. So it's not an absolute number. It's more that 10 years from your last period. That's the ideal time to start it. Um, and so, and for this reason, and this is a very simplified kind of explanation, but just think of when you go through menopause, that's when there's a deterioration in tissue in your body, right? So as you lose your estrogen, it affects every, every part of your body, right? So your brain cognitive function declines. Estrogen is very neuroprotective of the brain, right? So with the decline in estrogen, there's, there's changes in the brain. There's changes in the bone. You've got bone loss. There's changes in your cardiovascular system in the little tiny blood vessels. Um, with the lack of estrogen, blood vessels get um, less elastic, um, uh, more prone to atherosclerosis and calcium deposits. And it's... Um, and basically all the tissues of your body are kind of slowly declining, right? So the idea is if we can, if you're symptomatic and you're, and you want to, and, or you want to prevent some of these estrogen deficient changes from like progressing, if you're in this window where your tissues are still kind of healthier and younger, so to speak, that's the better window versus someone who is say 75, who now has had maybe even two decades of a loss of estrogen, they've had a lot of profound changes in their tissues. So those women are of a different risk, okay? So when so that, that timing thing is a really important concept. It's not that we can't offer it to much older women because there are women who will still suffer hot flashes for more than 10 years. The average amount of time that women are symptomatic is seven to 10 years. When you and I were trained, we were told it was two years. But the average, for the average woman, they will have some sort of menopausal hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, all that for seven to 10 years. And a small percentage, about 10 to 15% of women will be people, will be women who have symptoms for the rest of their lives. So I bring that up because some women are dismissed, like, oh, you can't still be having symptoms because it's over, you know, just, you should be over this in a couple of years. That's not true. We know they last a long time. So there are no absolute start and stop times, but there is an ideal window as, as, as I discussed. Um, so, and then, so I think we were going to talk about what are, what are the things that are not contraindications? So it's not contraindicated if you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, um, if you have diabetes, um, if you have a family history of diabetes or at high risk, um, diabetes I bring up because menopausal hormone therapy in this, in this window, right, in this 10-year window or so, women who start taking low-dose modern menopausal hormone therapy have a 30% reduced risk of developing diabetes. If you're already diabetic, you have better glycemic control. High blood pressure, using a transdermal patch may be beneficial on your blood pressure, and it's at least neutral. We know women who started early have less cardiovascular disease. They have a lower risk down the road of having a heart attack, stroke, atherosclerosis. And that's getting back to this idea of estrogen given early, particularly to symptomatic women, is going to be protective of your tissue so that you don't develop some of these age-related changes. So um, so other like things that are not contraindicated, family history of breast cancer. That is not a contraindication to menopausal hormone therapy a personal history of breast cancer. So if you've actually been treated, it is pretty much a contraindication, except in select cases. But a family history, a very high risk family history, or carrying a genetic mutation. So, oh, I'm a BRCA carrier, BRCA1 and 2 gene, which dramatically increases your risk of breast cancer. You are still a candidate for hormone therapy. 
Um, in fact, the studies show that women who take hormone therapy to help with their menopause, that their risk is not any is not increased any more than what their baseline risk already is. So it's important to know your baseline risk, but it's not going to be elevated over that, right? And that's because of the formulations and how we give hormone therapy these days than the way we were giving it over 20 years ago when some of this that big study was released. Um, I like to say we're using modern hormone therapy um, for the right indications for the right women. And in those cases, there is no increased risk. Um, That's so, really mind blowing what you just said. Yeah. So you know, this is super interesting. So you know the so the elephant in the room is is breast cancer, right? That is what everybody is afraid of, right? And that is why twenty years ago this study was stopped cold turkey yeah. because they found after a period of a few years they saw that women who were taking estrogen and synthetic progestin. So they were using formulas that we don't use as much these days, but estrogen synthetic progesterone had a tiny increased risk of breast cancer. When you take a step back and see what that increased risk was, it was very small. It was one extra case of breast cancer for every 1,000 women taking it per year. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny yeah, risk. Very small. And the devil's in the details. The risk was found in women who were taking it, they were, these are women who were over the age of 65. Many of them are over the age of 70. The study did not include young women. And they were given, so they were older women who were not screened for breast cancer prior to being in this study. There's lots of con confounding factors. Older women being given synthetic hormones. And that data does not translate to a younger symptomatic woman using more modern hormones. But the other mind blowing fact is that in this study, so there's two arms of the study. There was one arm of the study that was estrogen, is synthetic estrogen and synthetic progestin. And the other arm of the study were women who had their uterus removed who were only taking estrogen. Because when you do hormone therapy, if you don't have a uterus, you can, you can just do only estrogen. Sometimes we add progesterone in too, because it can be helpful. But if you have a uterus, you have to protect your uterine lining from estrogen. So you need to be given a progestin. So in the study, they used a synthetic progestin. These days we use um, bioidentical natural micronized progesterone, which has a much better safety profile. And we'll get into that. But in the arm of the study, the women who didn't have a uterus, who used synthetic estrogen, after 20 years in the study, they have a 30%, ready for it, decreased risk of breast cancer. Hear it again. 30% wow. decreased risk. Where's the news headline there? Because 20 years ago when they stopped that study, they saw that. They saw the beginning of that. But that message didn't make the, you know, the airwaves. The message was that the older women on this synthetic combination product had a tiny blip up in breast cancer. And that caused millions of women overnight to just stop cold turkey. So I want you to say that again. So you said 30% less chance of breast cancer in women that were taking hormone replacement? Yes. So in the two arms of the study, yeah. the arm where they were only taking estrogen, yeah. not a progestin, the 18-year follow-up of this Women Health Initiative study looked back and said, wow, those women had a 30% decreased risk of ever developing breast cancer. Amazing. So that along with a lot of studies that have come out since then and, and more detailed deep dive into that big study where they kind of pieced out and said, okay, let's take these older women who didn't even have menopausal symptoms anymore. Some of them were like 70 you know, plus years old. They had lots of other medical problems, lots of other confounding factors. Let's take a look at our very young patients, which was a very small fraction of this study. They, the study didn't even really look at women who were around the age of menopause it, for lots of reasons. But so it, when they looked at the younger women, those women also did not have an increased risk. The thought now is that women in the 10 years or so around the natural age of menopause, especially when they're given estrogen only, but now if they're given estrogen and if we use a non-synthetic progestin, like a progesterone, oral micronized progesterone, and now we use not synthetic estrogens, we mostly use bioidentical 
astrid dial, either in a patch or a pill form. That combination, I like to call that modern menopausal hormone therapy to differentiate it from Premarin, Prempro, these were the synthetics. The synthetics aren't terrible, remember. They're, they are still highly effective. There are some women who we use synthetics in because they may have a better, they may tolerate some of the side effects better. It's not all bad because remember, even in this study, using synthetic Premarin, which is equine estrogen, all right? Those women over 18 years, estrogen alone had a 30% decrease. The women who took it with synthetic progestin had a tiny uptick. And now we know that if they probably would have been just given real progesterone instead of the synthetic progestin, they, we probably wouldn't have seen even that tiny little uptick. But because of that tiny uptick, a generation of women lost out on their symptoms being treated. But even more importantly, when you look at data, there's these really interesting slides I can I'll show you. We can put it in the notes if you want. Of Over the past 20 years, men's health, men's health for chronic diseases, cardiac disease, dementia has improved. I'm oversimplifying this, but basically over the past 20 plus years, there's been vast improvements. In women's cardiac health, it's been a decline. And it's yeah. really interesting. You see the decline go down right around the time when this WHI study was stopped and women went off their hormones. Now we know that if women start taking menopausal hormone therapy by choice because of their symptoms or to prevent one of the FDA approved indications, again, I'm not saying that everyone should just take it, right? But if you've got an indication for it, you, we see that you have, you are lowering your risks of a lot of these chronic diseases, including diabetes, cardiac disease, atherosclerosis, and dementia. So, you know, the question is, is what have we done to a generation of women? We've denied them from this protective, you know, kind of option that they have all from this really unfounded fear of, of breast cancer, right? Um, and then the other big fear was blood clot and strokes. And again, the same thing holds true. The people who had this elevated risk were people using the synthetic pro progestin. And it was really the only, the risk was really seen mostly in the older population who had all of these chronic illnesses already. Um, so, you know, the devil, as you know, in medicine, the devil's in the details, right? right. So, but because of that, which I know we want to talk about genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So we've talked about like hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, anxiety, mood stuff, all of that. But there's also a lot going down in the genital urinary tract um, affecting you, your urinary system and your urinary health, as well as your sexual health. And it's important, systemic hormone therapy is an indication for that. But what's so important is that we have local vaginal estrogen options to treat that for women who, for whatever reason, don't want to take systemic therapy. They're concerned about risks or side effects, or it's just not something they're interested in. But because this estrogen has been labeled as scary, even little local vaginal estrogen has literally been denied to women for decades now. And it's just, that's really utter nonsense because we know it's locally absorbed. It's treating that area. Um, there's little risk of absorption. And even women who've had a blood clot or breast cancer can take it. So that's a, that's a particular area of menopause that I'm super passionate about because it's so easy and cheap to treat these women. Um, and and I, I can't tell you how many women come to my, my practice and they're crying. They're like, I can't, like, I can't have sex with my partner. I have lost all my sex drive. It's impacting my relationship. And I'm like, are you having these physical symptoms of menopause? Yes. What did your doctor tell you? Use lube. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, and it's because of this messaging. Doctors and patients are like, oh, estrogen, no. But it doesn't even make sense. I'm like, come on, we're doctors. We need to like level up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's such great information. And I love the way that you broke down all that research and everything that's, you know, come about since that study. I think that's so important to understand and know. And, you know, even as a patient, right, you can go to your practitioner and after listening to this podcast, you can tell them that, no, this is what the research shows now. And this is where we're at. And, you know, it's important to be treated if you absolutely, if you, you know, do not have a contraindication, it's even more so 
important to be treated because it impacts every aspect of your life, right? Especially the cognitive function part of it. I mean, it's I, so fascinating. I'm like in perimenopause and I feel like I'm in a constant state of brain fog. So yeah. Well, it's so, so it's super interesting. And I want everyone to know this. And, and there was just a study that was out that I, I TikToked about actually. Um, you, you've inspired me with the TikToks because I love your TikToks. They're so informative and amazing. Um, but you know, this is super interesting. Estrogen is neuroprotective. Do you know two thirds of Alzheimer patients are women? Two thirds. Okay. Because they're living longer. Well, a couple of things. They're living longer, but this is super interesting. Men have an andropause, right? They they do slowly lose the testosterone, but at a much later age than women. And what women don't understand is that testosterone in a man is converted by his fat cells to low levels of estrogen, which is very helpful on a man's brain too. We, 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 both men and women have estrogen and progesterone. But the difference between men and women, and this is like standard science, that is the Alzheimer Association, any professional organization, they know that women, because they lose their estrogen decades before men ever drop their estrogen in their brain, because of that, that loss of estrogen is the single biggest reason why women are, you know, the majority of Alzheimer's patients, right? Wow. So age and being born a female are the two biggest risk factors, age and being, so you're right. Women are living longer, but they're living longer in an estrogen deficient state. And for a longer period of time. Yeah. And for long, and, and they're also the primary caregivers of right. men and children yes. you know, of other things. So it's yes. like, if we are not taking care of these women and so, Again, the timing thing is really important. The studies have shown that you can't just throw an estrogen patch at someone who's 70 years old and 75 and expect them to have cognitive improvement or benefit. In fact, you can make things worse for them because you're giving the estrogen in a totally different environment where the brain tissue is changed. There's vascular changes and, you know, tissue changes there. Very, very different conversation than talking about a 45 or a 50 something or a young 60 year old woman who is concerned about our symptoms and our cognitive function. There yeah. can be, there's, there's excellent data showing that there's a significant neuroprotective effect and a much lower risk of cognitive decline and dementia. And think about how powerful that is on women's quality of lives, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we've women that for decades. It's actually, it's societal medical malpractice and it's gender inequity in its highest form, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So yes, I know you were talking about the cognitive decline and the importance of estrogen in women, but um, you know, not only that, but we have the gender urinary symptoms of menopause. So maybe you could just talk to our listeners a little bit about what that is and what that means and what we can do about it. Sure. Super important. I think because we don't see our genital urinary tissue as women, we don't, we don't really see it. It's hard for us to conceptualize what is happening in menopause. But to, to really simplify it, I want everyone to think of their vagina, their bladder, okay? Because it's not just vaginal health, we're talking urinary health, vagina and bladder, the urethra, the outside of your um, genitals, the vulva, the clitoris, the labia, the opening of the vagina. Think of that as all as one unit, very similar tissue. All has tons of estrogen receptors. You go through menopause and in, the majority of women, they're going to have some significant tissue changes due to that dramatic loss of estrogen. Estrogen is responsible in your vagina and your genital urinary um, tissue, as well as in your face and everywhere else in your body. It's the driver of collagen, elastin production, um, uh, the ability for that tissue to um, retain moisture, and the ability for blood vessels and nerve endings to kind of grow and, and be there, right? So if you look at a microscopic slide of a, you know, a someone who's younger versus someone who's menopausal, and also if you just look at just kind of what it just looks like with the naked eye, the appearance, you'll see the thin is plump and thick and vibrant with lots of moisture and blood vessels and nerve endings. And then when you go through menopause, the tissue shrinks, it's thinner. It's drier, less lubricated, less collagen, less support, less elasticity of the vagina. And whatever we say in the vagina, it's happening in the bladder too. So 
not only are women around, you know, midlife, maybe dealing with some urinary incontinence issues, whether it's stress incontinence from, you know, maybe they've had a bunch of pregnancies, you know, um, vaginal deliveries, pelvic surgeries, anything that can, you know, damage that pelvic floor support. So they're maybe coughing and sneezing and then leaking a little bit of urine. So some of it is from kind of like pregnancy and stuff, but a lot of it is because the tissue has just simply lost the support of collagen and elastin and, and all, everything else I just talked about. So that is kind of what, why we call it the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which is a really lame, you know, name. It's like long and it sounds complicated to women. Um, but I, I, I take time to explain it because it's more than just a dry vagina. Okay. Yeah. If it's just a dry vagina, fine. Right. That, that's important, but it's more than that. We're talking about sexual function, arousal, lubrication, urinary function. Again, like, we talked about, we've got a generation of women sitting in nursing homes right now in diapers with vulvar ulcers, with chronic urinary tract infections. You and I both know a common reason for a, an older person to be admitted to the hospital is yeah. sepsis. One yeah. of the most likely places for them to get sepsis is from yeah. a urinary tract infection rising yeah. up to the kidney. What would prevent probably a large, probably two thirds or more if you speak to the urologists who are experts, like Dr. Rachel Rubin, everyone should follow her, and Dr. Kelly Casperson on social. They're they're always talking about this. These are urology experts. If we just treated women with local vaginal estrogen, and we're going to tell different forms, comes in lots of different forms, very safe. When I say local, I mean it's locally applied um, and locally absorbed into the genitourinary syndrome, uh, genitourinary tissue. And it, it will improve the tissue quality. So if we would just treat women preventatively, and it's very easy to do, we would, one, help lots of marriages and sex lives. Um, we'd help women feel comfortable on a day-to-day -day basis. We'd be preventing a lot of urinary symptoms. And we'd be preventing a lot of these complications that women see when they're older and needlessly suffer. So it's something I'm super passionate about um, because it's easy to treat. It's cheap to treat. Um, it's accessible, meaning like you could have contraindications from systemic menopausal hormone therapy, but you can still be prescribed vaginal estrogen. So you could have had a blood clot. You could be an active breast cancer patient, you know, um, any of the contraindications, active liver disease, but we could still give you low dose vaginal estrogen. You do not need to suffer. So that's super important. And if any doctor tells you just use a little lube, you're going to tell them, well, how does the lube improve my collagen and my blood flow and my tissue quality? Lube's not going to help there. Use lube. I love lube. Use it all the time. Use it when you're 16. Use it when you're 80. I don't care. That's great. But if we are ignoring the tissue changes there and just putting a bandaid of a lubricant on it, it's, it's, it's not going to help. It should be used as an adjunct, the lubrication. It's, lubrication is not replacing you know, vaginal estrogen treatment. And same with these vaginal moisturizers. Vaginal moisturizers, there's a million out there. They're all trying to get your money. It's great if you like the way they make you feel. They're doing absolutely nothing to truly improve your tissue quality. If you like the way they make you feel and they help you on a day-to-day, -day, you know, day-to-day -day basis, just feel a little bit more comfortable, that's great. But understand what you really need is to just improve your tissue quality. And then you probably don't need to go buy that vaginal moisturizer. Or you can if you like it, that's fine. But like, let's not pretend that that's replacing what we know scientifically works. So tell me this, um, Karen, what would you say to somebody that is, um, you know, older? Uh, is there a time frame that you can do the vaginal estrogen or no? Or you can do vaginal estrogen you at any time? You can do it anytime. So, okay. you know, and, and, and anytime, because again, the studies are extremely clear on this. They've checked the blood levels of women who yeah. are taking. So there's lots of different forms of vaginal estrogen. There's little pills, there's little tablets, there's little waxy capsules, there's creams, there's little rings even that you could stick in the vagina and that slowly release the hormone over three months. In all of these cases, your systemic level of estrogen does not rise higher than the normal menopausal level. So it's very safe. And for women who are particularly nervous, say someone has breast cancer, there are some newer products. Um, Invexia is one that I love. 
that has a very, very low dose. It's a little gel cap. It's only four micrograms of estradiol. Very, very safe, right? And we even have a product called Intrarosa, um, which is DHEA, which is a precursor to estrogen. And um, basically, this is really amazing. Um, this gets absorbed into the tissue and in the cell, the cell converts the DHA to estrogen and to some androgens. And so you're, there's not actually even estrogen in it. So, but regardless, they're all safe. And you could be many years without hormone. You could be a 75 year old who just never took, took hormone therapy and is like, wait, I could feel better down there and maybe want to have sex with my husband or maybe just feel more comfortable and, you know, kind of protect myself from UTIs. She, that woman should be offered it. I think it should be given to everybody as they go into the nursing home. But I honestly, I think they should, it should be talked about for every woman as she enters her forties. You know, the other common in, the question I get is um, birth control pills. A lot of women have vaginal dryness on the birth control pills um, or from the birth control pill. Cause it's one of the side effects of the pill. Um, but also because a lot of perimenopausal women are on the birth control pill to help with their perimenopausal symptoms. So they're already kind of going down that menopausal road. And, you know, vaginal estrogen a couple times a week for those women can do like wonders and it is very safe. So you can take it with the birth control pill. You could take it with hormone therapy. You could take it on its own. You could take it at any age. There's really no limitations. Um, so, you know, that's like, to me, it's like a no brainer. So I'm wondering, you know, what about the oral um, hormone replacement that you're taking or the menopause therapy that you're taking? Would that not help your vaginal? Sure. Um, yeah, it definitely helps. Listen, it, it definitely helps. But when it comes down to really improving the tissue quality of skin, nothing is going to improve it as much as the topical. Um, Younger women. So, if you know, a lot of times the vaginal and urinary complaints for many women are a, a little bit later. It's not like the first thing they complain about. Right. So I find if I've got like a 51 year old who's really new to menopause, she's not really complaining of those symptoms yet. And we start on hormone therapy. We're kind of maintaining things and she probably doesn't need it. I make the case that it's going to only just amp it up a little bit more and preserve the function. So I generally promote it, but, um, you know, if you're on systemic hormone therapy and you're not having a problem down there, then you're getting enough absorbed. But in most patients who present with the complaints like, oh, my God, I'm so dry down there. The systemic therapy is never going to be enough to really get, you know, get there. Right. So anyway, that's that's kind of it. <laughs> That is so good to know. I'm learning so much and I really appreciate it. So tell me this. Um, I know that, you know, there's lots of different people that women can go to. Um, you know, what's, what's the difference, I guess, from a person that you may go to a gynecologist that is a regular gynecologist, as opposed to somebody that say is NAM certified, like you mentioned that North American menopause society, um, you know, what, what would be the difference there? Well, listen, there's lots of great OBGYNs out there who are not NAM certified and they have an interest and they've kept up to date and they've actually read the North American menopause study guidelines. It's like a 20 page thing. It's got bullet points. Like you don't really need to be a menopause specialist to prescribe this. It's very clear, the guidelines and evidence. So if you're an OBGYN out there listening, or if you're a patient and you're, you love your OBGYN, but he or she has been on the fence or not, you know, one of the things I recommend is you could just, you could print up the guidelines. We'll, yeah. we'll put it at the end of the show notes. Be like, hi, this is what I'd like. Can you please, you know, if they're, they're pushing back, give them a copy of the guidelines. Um, but if if they're resistant and you're not getting the answers, the North American Menopause Society, so it's menopause.org, maintains a list not only of certified, the NAM certified menopause practitioners like myself, where, you know, we did professional education and we took a test and we have to maintain our um, continuing ad to maintain that credential. Um, and so they're kind of certifying that we're up to date on the evidence-based guidelines. Um, there are also a listing of just the NAMS members. So just, so I would just say those are, those are physicians who are just menopause literate, right? Sure. So you need, you should find someone who's menopause literate or NAMS certified, and you can just type in your zip code and you'll find that person. Um, telehealth now has exploded for this. I'm, I do it. I'm a hundred percent telehealth practice and I'm also a medical advisor and a prescriber on alloy. 
um, myalloy.com, which is a menopause telehealth um, app. And there's a bunch of other of, of telehealth companies out there that are doing great work. So you can get access to the care. So I tell women, if your general OBGYN is not comfortable, not knowledgeable, not willing, or just doesn't have the time, you can't get an appointment for six months, you know, it's okay. You just don't have to suffer. There's a lot of ways for you to get care. Um, so if you're, if you're having questions, you, sh- you deserve to get care. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, my favorite place to send people. And then the other place I have this book here, so I could show you estrogen matters. This literally changed my life on so many ways. It was written by Dr. Avram Blooming and Dr. Carol um, Tavris. Um, and basically he's a breast oncologist. He's retired now, but he is a very prominent breast oncologist who just kind of saw the damage that was being done to women being denied hormone therapy. And so he, his book is why taking hormones and menopause can improve women's well-being and lengthen their lives without raising the risk of breast cancer. So this book eloquently in a very patient friendly and doctor friendly way really just lays out just beautifully where we came from, the history, the study, the evidence in the most lovely way, super easy to understand and really turns, you know, even me, I was very, you know, I'm very passionate about this field, but he really, he really explains and really digs down and understanding, you know, why we, you know, why we had all these, you know, missed, um, you know, this misinformation. And so I encourage anybody who's really trying to advocate for themselves, read this book, um, the audible version is lovely because he actually, him and um, Dr. Tavers, who he read it with, they read it themselves. So it, it just really sunk in for me. So that's an amazing, amazing resource. Um, and I'll send you a link. We did a webinar with him. So if someone wants, doesn't want to read the book, they want to just do the 45 minute webinar um, at Ally. We, we did a webinar with him and anybody can watch it on YouTube. So um, I think it's really helpful for doctors as well. Oh, that is awesome. I will be sure to check that out. So, yeah. so lastly, maybe you could tell people, um, again, I know you did it on our previous episode, but maybe you could just let our listeners and viewers know how they can get in touch with you. I know you mentioned a little bit in the beginning that you are with Alloy, but um, just uh, sure. as we kind of wrap up a little bit. Yep, absolutely. So easiest way, I'm on Instagram, Dr. Men, OBGYN. Um, my website's just drmen.com. That's just D-R-M-E-N-N.com. Um, yeah, and you can send me a contact um, through the contact form there. You can send me a message if you want to see me or if you need some help and resources. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram. And I'm on TikTok, thanks to you, because you inspired me. So, <laughs> well, yeah. you're awesome. Well, <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I know I learned tons and definitely will be prescribing hormone replacement, or as you said, menopause um, therapy treatment to everyone Mm -hmm. uh, as they go through their menopause transition. I think it's so important. And this is such important information to have and be knowledgeable about and to be able to advocate for yourself, right? So I think it's all good and um, very good information. So thank you so much. And well, we are done here and it's been real and really intimate and remember this is not meant to be any type of medical advice so if you need medical advice regarding uh hormones please reach out to dr men she's more than happy to help you out and or visit the menopause.org menopause society and get information regarding hormone replacement um, on that website so Until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one coaching with Dr. Lodi, please visit drsadaf.com. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast.